Josh Brown, the console generation thunders on, and why not talk about some boss battles? What do you think about them? There have been some sensational ones over the past four years, Scott Tilver, to the point where it was incredibly difficult <laughs> to narrow down this list. I wish it was a top 50. I love the idea of trying to rank the best bosses of the generation. We have no duplicate video games here. Only one boss per video game. I think per franchise as well, but we'll get there. Before we get to the full top 10, we do have honorable mentions either side. What are yours, Josh Brown? Well, full spoilers going forward because yes. I need to talk about all of these games in depth and I'm kicking off my honorable mentions with Marvel's Spider-Man 2 and I kind of just wanted to put every boss fight <laughs> on here because that was the element where I thought Insomniac just leveled up the entire experience. These boss fights are sometimes multi-phase epics that are really mechanically demanding mm -hmm. which was surprising to me but if I had to choose one I think I would go Peter versus Miles when Peter is consumed by the symbiote and it's a dramatic fight. The narrative weight of it, I think, is really well conveyed. It comes just after another boss battle, so you're already feeling like a little bit fatigued. The way they incorporate the symbiote's weaknesses into the stage is amazing. The score coming in makes it grandiose. The personal beef between Miles and Spidey, <laughs> it's pretty excellent. It's a real highlight narratively and mechanically for that entire game. In Somniac are the best studio in the world. Yeah, they're pretty Fight good. me. Fight me, Josh. Not bad. Now, switching for my second honorable mention, I'm going to go from one of the most graphically lavish games you've ever seen to a real nasty but still equally beautiful 2D game, and that's Blasphemous 2, and in particular, the boss, Everturno First of the Penitence. Yes. Did I get that one right this Apparently, time, Scott Tilford? Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just someone who looks at all the words all at once. Pen Mispronounced that on the first take <laughs> of this, if you could tell I redid that. <laughs> this guy, Scott, absolutely kicked my backside in. Now, Blasphemous 1 was a really difficult game but blasphemous 2 if you played the first isn't that bad until it is and right. this dual stage boss is pretty much one of the toughest things i've faced this entire generation but it's not just on here because of the difficulty it's on here because of the visual splendor of it initially he just looks like some guy mm -hmm. but suddenly there's this wave of flourishes that he comes out with all of these attacks going off on the screen at once it's a test of your metal it's a test of your agility and with it being a two-stage boss it's an endurance test as well <laughs> it's a test that i failed josh Frank. <laughs> yeah it's a test that i failed many many times scott tilford but the sense of euphoria when you finally beat this guy oh if if it's the good if, stuff if I could choose a top 11, this thing <laughs> would get on it. My honorable mentions are from three separate games. Uh, one is a set of bosses from Sifu. I wanted to shout out uh, Fajar, Sean, Kuroki, Jin Feng, and Yang, mainly because they're all as good as each other. It's not like anyone really stood out in Sifu. I feel like that game has a really cool approach to bosses in, uh, overall, where they've each kind of got a gimmick. They've got a specific timing mechanic or something that you get down. And once you do, you really turn the tables on them and it feels incredible. But at the same time, no one really stands out. Maybe Yang, if I had to pick from them, but just shout out to Sifu overall. That game's melee combat, that game's general approach to boss design is just awesome. Another one is Cthon in Marvel's Midnight Suns. I get that people don't like that game, whatever. You're all missing out. It's phenomenal. <laughs> that game is absolutely rules. It's by Fire Access, the people that did XCOM. I'm as sick as superheroes as the next person, but that game plays so well. Like I said, it's, its combat is just so solid. And by the time you get to the end, they do a really cool mechanic where you're sacrificing certain party members to go through waves of enemies. So your best people that you've been working with the whole time time are maybe not available when you need them to be. It's all based on which relationships you've made with the characters to that point. And there's a whole bunch of different waves that you have to get through before you finally fight Cthon itself. I just love that whole game. I love it. I love it so much and it's never going to get its due, but it's awesome. And the last one, uh, super quick, is the True Helsha Men Monstria from Psychonauts 2, which is a, just a thing. Just you've uh, given yourself some crazy pronunciations <laughs> for this video, Scott. Quick little insight and bless Mr. Dan Durkin editing this, that yeah, sometimes the voiceover is attack. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> the scripts come for us when we're trying to put stuff together. Uh, Psychonauts 2, a gorgeous, gorgeous game from Double Fine. I can't recommend the making of that game enough. It's over on their YouTube channel. But this boss in particular surrounds this character called Bob. He's putting his life back together and you're sort of inside his mind realizing what's going on. Why is he distanced himself from the rest of the Psychonauts? And you're um, literally fighting his doubts made manifest. You're fighting versions of these people that he doesn't think care about him anymore who are manifested in his mind as these big angry flowers because um, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a gardener. 
so he's putting this lovely little garden together, but every now and then the seeds attack him, and it's about reminding him that he does have allies, he does have companions, and just getting him out of that rut that he's in. And I like anything where you're directly fighting a certain feeling itself. Not to spoil that we're gonna have Final Fantasy 16 in here somewhere, but I love some anime-ass business. Hey, who hasn't wanted to do that in real life before. <laughs> if I could make that manifest myself, Scott Tailford, I absolutely would. Punch doubt in the mush. Hell yeah. But anyway, let's get to the actual top 10. I'm Scott. I'm Josh. And these are the 10 best video game boss battles of the generation so far. Number 10, Spawn of Ogdo, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Oh my now, god. this is gonna sound like I'm doing a bit, like <laughs> I'm putting a comedy entry in at number 10 because you could have more dramatic boss fights from Jedi Survivor on here. I can mm -hmm. think of at least three off the top of my head, including that spectacular Darth Vader fight. But if I'm being truthful, Spawn of Ogdo absolutely deserves its place because it's so rare that you see a developer just having a laugh <laughs> with the player at their expense. If you don't know the history with Ogdo, Ogdo Bogdo oh, was God. a big froggy freak <laughs> that you could fight at the start of the prequel game, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. And he became a meme essentially for being this early test of skill that was way too hard. He was for broken, Josh. At the time. He was outright broken where he wasn't probably supposed to be. <laughs> and it became a meme that despite all of the different enemies you face in that game, it was Ogdo Bogdo who kicked your ass the most. So going into the sequel, I don't think anyone expected to see Ogdo again. No. And the way this guy is placed in the world is genius. You fight through an encampment of droids and other enemies, and then suddenly the ground gives way, you fall into a pit, and who emerges from the darkness? <sighs> the spawn of Ogdo. <laughs> and that alone, honestly, would have given me enough of a pop to make it a worthy inclusion on mm -hmm. this list. But the fact is, spawn of Ogdo is this time around intentionally one of the hardest boss fights in the game, but one of the most satisfying to overcome. This is like a Souls boss in a Jedi game. And and when I first dropped into that pit, one, I was cackling because I could not believe they had done this to me. But two, I made it my life's work to make sure this guy died in this play session. As a result, it took me two hours to kill him. Oh my and it took me until 2 a.m. to finally best this boss, uh -huh. learn all of the patterns, learn some of his broken hitboxes, and finally deliver that killing blow. And let me tell you, I don't regret a second wasted. When I'm on my deathbed and I'm looking back at my life in my regrets, <laughs> fighting spawn of Ogdo to my last breath will not be one of those regrets. I've got to shout out how, I mean, I, I, any respawn devs in the audience can shout out whether that, that thing actually is broken or not, but some of those hitboxes, like you mentioned, are ridiculous. That tongue attack that it does, where even if it's going to do the tongue attack and you're about to land where the end of the tongue might be, it'll just snap you to the end of it regardless. I would have dodged that, to be honest, respawn. I didn't even land there, but you insist on making me die to this thing. They go one step further in this game as well when you unlock the different challenges, there's a thing where you can go up against two Ogdos. Dude. Two Ogdos, Jeremy. It's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's insane. insane. No one needs that in their life. But like you said, Respawn know exactly what they're doing. This thing, I can't... It, it is one of the best boss fights of the generation because it's just so unanimously hated. But oh my God, that... This... Oh, I hated it. The first fight and then the dual Ogdo fights. Man, I have <laughs> rarely been so mad while crying with laughter. They got... <laughs> me not once, they got me twice, and if they do it a third time in the next sequel, oh, I'll laugh again. Three Ogdos. Three Ogdos, Jeremy. Keep them away from me. Number nine, Bahamut Final Fantasy 16. Narrowing this down was impossible. Final Fantasy 16 is loaded with ridiculously awesome boss fights. I absolutely love the gear that they shift into when Kupka is introduced. The second phase um, of his fight where the weird sort of J-rock metal music starts coming in. It reminds me of Devil May Cry. You're suddenly sprinting towards the boss. You're fighting them in midair. There's quick time events everywhere. That's a really cool fight. Even to the one when you fight Barnabas and you have that incredible music underneath where it 
it just feels like you're fighting for the spirit of the planet itself. I can't get enough. However, the Bahamut fight is where they overall lift the, the level of what you thought was possible in this game. They go full Dragon Ball, full anime, full fusion between Clive um, and his brother uh, Joshua. Joshua is the only way you can deliver that line. I love this fight. This thing is a, a whole mix of the quick time events that were introduced during the Cupcake stuff. You've got the fact that they're fusing together to give the, a different melee style almost, where you've got all these really over the top different moves that if free to Risen can use. I just think it's exemplary of a certain scale being directly controllable that hardly any games have ever really done. It reminded me a lot of the old school God of War fights, like that bit in God of War 3 when you're fighting um, Kronos and the camera keeps zooming out. What if that stuff was playable? What if that general feel of how big that fight was, was directly controllable? I know the Final Fantasy 16, you know, didn't go down that well with every single person who played it, but I absolutely adored this thing. It was my game of the year for 2023. And I just, I think this is a high point. You're either fully on board with uh, this general twisting of what Final Fantasy is to make it more action oriented and bringing in all those anime influences and Dragon Ball type stuff, or you were just like, nah, this isn't for me whatsoever. If you were on board, this was unbeatable. Yeah, I mean, look, I had my issues with Final Fantasy 16, but the boss fights were not one of them. Mm. And I was always impressed by how when you thought the developers had hit their ceiling in terms of scale, they would smash through that ceiling <laughs> and you would literally go to space. I similarly to you, Scott, like would struggle with just picking one from Final Fantasy 16 because pretty much every boss in that game would deserve a spot on this list. Mm -hmm. Number eight, Answer, Baldur's Gate 3. Now, Baldur's Gate 3 is a pretty big game, and Answer is an optional boss that actually comes in Act 3. So there's a good chance that if you didn't do everything in Baldur's Gate 3, you might have missed this entirely. Hell, even if you find the corpse of this dragon, you don't even necessarily have to fight it. Like I you, fought Scott him. Tilford. He, I fought him, he killed me. I thought, no, I'm going to sneak around you, mate. Sneak I don't need to around, fight you. Sneak around, sneak out the back. Who needs the loot? Well, I do. This <laughs> hits on this list because there are similarly mechanically spectacular fights throughout Baldur's Gate 3, but I don't think any of them, for me personally, managed to weave narrative importance with the mechanical satisfaction of the fight itself because I need to spoil Baldur's Gate 3 to really drive home why this was so spectacular for me. So you get this mission relatively early on to go and find this creature, which is apparently locked under Baldur's Gate itself. If you don't know who Answer is, he was essentially one of the heroes from the years previous, along with Baldur himself, who created the entire city, and they have a relationship. So, when you finally go down and find one, the dragon is dead and will not help you in the upcoming fight, but two, you can talk to it, and he's not going to help you at all. In fact, he's going to fight you. <laughs> yeah. It's a big revelation. A alongside the fact that he suddenly starts addressing the Mind Flayer companion who you've only known as the Emperor throughout the entire game so far, mm -hmm. and suddenly he starts referring to him as Boulder, and you think, what is going on? Have I missed something? No, the it turns out in Baldur's Gate. that the Boulder in Baldur's Gate, you've been traveling with him this whole time, he's been this Mind Flayer things have changed right before your eyes. So, because of their rift, suddenly you're fighting this dragon, and then you get into the fight itself, which is incredibly hard, but incredibly satisfying to overcome as you are bombarded with these devastating electrical attacks that really require you to have made up your party in a thoughtful and specific way. It's a tough fight. It killed me a lot. It meant I lost a lot of progress, but again, it was worth every second because not only was it a visual spectacle, but now suddenly it had all of this emotion and it mm. had all of this drama imbued in it that I I honestly was not expecting when I first went down there. I was expecting to meet a cool dragon, and what I got was my favorite plot twist of the entire game wrapped in a blood wrapped in a boss fight. That's very nicely put. I wonder if this is a more intense fight than the Elder Brain fight later on. Like, this has a lot more to it in terms of it's hanging on that specific twist versus, like, just stopping the invasion. It was for me, you know. I yeah. thought it was more intense. Um, the Elder Brain fight I enjoyed a lot, but honestly... Ansia and um, Raphael, both optional fights, but mm. both incredible and packed with a surprising amount of um, nuance and narrative detail. What a game! <laughs> Number seven, Commander Circuit. 
Gravity Circuit. I just need to keep shouting this game out. I'll keep shouting it out. Are you going to play it yet? Have you played Gravity Circuit yet? If you borrow me, baby. Play you got to play Gravity Circuit, mate. I don't mind how much people don't necessarily care about 2D side-scrolling things. Gravity Circuit is immaculate. It's a more melee-based take on the Mega Man formula. Let's say it just plays so immaculately. It's so, so tight. And by the time you get to the final boss, Commander Circuit, this is a brutally tough fight. Something that, because you're already dealing with pixel perfect, you know, very precision-based moves, attacks, spaces on the screen where you can be, things, areas where it's safe, areas where you're going to get wiped out, you need to memorize the whole thing. It's kind of straight like Cuphead energy, which to a point with Cuphead, I eventually got sick of that, where I was like, I'm not memorizing 45 minutes of a certain fight just to breeze through it in 30 seconds. However, Gravity Circuit, it did take me the better part of an afternoon on this one fight, just reloading, learning everything, but also fighting and keeping up on the fly. Like, you're aware of the different moves that are coming at you. At that stage in the game, you're aware of the different attack patterns and things like that, things to look for, and the different ways that you've equipped your character to deal with them. I just think this is an exemplary 2D boss. There are lots of, obviously, 2D side-scrolling fighting games, you know, platformers, etc. but this one just really stands out. And then the music is just so epic underneath it as well. You can almost substitute this for, you know, whatever your favorite super tight 2D action platformer of choice is, but I just want to shout out Gravity Circuit. I do think it is that damn good. And I play a lot of these games. It's just that it's so literally pixel perfect. I want to ask you a question, and yes. I don't want to put you on the spot, and this might not even make it into the edit, <laughs> but you have another 2D game on this list. What makes the difficulty that comes at the end of a 2D game like this mm. more palatable for you when compared to something like an Elden Ring or Lies of Peace? This, I think this is a debate that the comments can weigh on as well. Does 2D difficulty feel harder than 3D difficulty? I think it does come down to how many options you have in the moment. Like, it depends what your abilities are, like whatever mechanics you've got. I don't know, there's something about 2D difficulty that I guess I grew up on, in a way, even though I not that I'm an ancient man, but I, like, there's something about difficulty in a 2D space that is finite. It's it's filling the screen in terms of there are safe zones, there are, you know, different laser beams to avoid. There's a a readability to it, there's a legibility to it that sometimes doesn't come through fully in 3D because then you get lost in hitbox stuff and like, oh, the edges of that laser caught me anyway or that animation triggered anyway or whatever. Whereas I think for 2D stuff, it can be a bit easier to, or not necessarily easier, it can be a bit tighter in regards to where literally being pixel precise. We can watch that footage back and frame by frame it and go, okay, fine, that thing got me. And on the development side, they can do the same thing and tweak to make sure that stuff is accurate. There's just something about um, 2D difficulty that, yeah, for whatever reason, I can comprehend hand it a bit more comfortably than 3D stuff, but at the same time, I've slogged through everything from Elden Ring to Zagiro to whatever else. Hey, that's very well put, and I'm going to put you on the spot more often now. Please do. Number six, Heimdall, God of War Ragnarok. Right. God of War Ragnarok is a sequel that had a big shoes to fill, especially when it came to the boss fights. Everyone can remember the first time the stranger knocked at Kratos' door in the first game, all the way through to the final Valkyrie boss. So going into Ragnarok, Everyone was asking, do the developers have what it takes to match that level of surprise and intensity? And for my money, they absolutely knocked it out of the park mm -hmm. right from the opening with Kratos versus Thor, which has that excellent fake out where Kratos dies and then he's brought back to life with the hammer. Excellent. But if I have to choose one, and I do because it's this list, <laughs> I'm going to go with Heimdall because, again, that's another boss fight to me that perfectly meshes dramatic stakes with mechanical intensity. Mm -hmm. I think this boss fight is so incredibly done because, for me, Heimdall is maybe the only character in the entire game that you can't wait to kill. Yeah. He is a prick all the way through with the story, intentionally so, because paradoxically, he's like the one guy you're not supposed to kill. Yes. In universe, if you kill Heimdall, that's pretty much starting Ragnarok. Kratos knows this, the player knows this. So when you finally confront this character after spending a bunch of hours, even just trying to craft a weapon that can hurt him to begin with, mm. because his entire gimmick is that he knows what you're gonna do before you do, so you can't even hit him. Suddenly it has this extra intensity of, we're following up an emotional beat, we're following up this escalation in the story, and you know if you kill him, and Kratos wants to, things are gonna go wrong. And the escalation of the fight is excellent because when you start hitting Heimdall, 
Kratos actually shows mercy. He tries to practice mercy. He does his best to repress the god of war that he's known for in Greece and try to live a different way. But it's Heimdall, even with an exploded arm, who <laughs> keeps pushing forward. He keeps threatening Kratos. He keeps threatening his son. Mm -hmm. And it gets to a point where you realize that this guy can't live. Kratos will not let this guy live. And you start seeing shades of the god of war that he used to be in the fight. The aggression starts ramping up to the point where Kratos chokes the guy to death, blows the horn, and you know exactly what that means. You know he's on the path to this prophecy. And in terms of making you feel the consequence of violence, you know what this has meant before if you've played the previous games in the destruction of the Greek mythology. You know what it means for Ragnarok because the entire game is based around the prophecy of the end of the entire realm. And feeling that through gameplay is genius, man. You can have as many cinematics as you want, but if you don't feel the drama of a moment like this while you're actually playing the game, you haven't capitalized on something's full potential, which this absolutely does, in my opinion. Totally, man. Like That whole thing about what video games can bring to the table as a medium, that walking that line between cinematics and gameplay, like during that fight, you do just want to kill Heimdall. I totally get the whole, uh, the wider ramifications of what that means, but at some point, because the threats do keep coming, you're like, I just want to, I'm just going to take this guy out. And then if it gives me a choice, I'm going to do it. Like Ellie and Abby, I'll just be taking someone out um, and going from there. And so, yeah, I think that it's worth highlighting this as one of the absolute best to depictions of when cinematics and gameplay meet to make the player have the same mindset as Kratos and then following that through and living with the consequences. What a game. Number five, Ravenbeak Metroid Dread. I think this is the other 2D game that you were thinking of. I was. It's I was... in 3D, Josh. No, but it's like only in 3D for a bit, in it? Yeah, like a little it's, bit. It's like 2.5 games. <laughs> There's lots of, little, lots of little cutaways and zooms to show some more cinematic kills and things. I can't recommend Metroid Dread enough, but it does go into that same general category of this is absolutely pristine and perfect gameplay. I think if we're talking about the best boss battles, you do want something that pushes the player to, you know, use everything that they've acquired to that point and think about combining those different abilities in ways that they maybe haven't done before and then take it to the next level. The Ravenbeak boss fight is so intense. And I talk about in 2D games, having those safe zones or realizing after you had a whole screen wipe, oh, okay, I should have dodged that and then dashed and jumped up here and hang time up here while this thing on the ground happens or whatever. And then learning to exist in that space and just have that fight. And even though the fight itself maybe only takes about five, 10 minutes, it is some of the most intense gameplay you'll ever have because you're right there in the pocket with that boss. And I just love that. I think that it works on the story level. Metroid Dread has some great story beats in it in regards to Samus herself and who Ravenbeak is. So when you actually come face to face with him, it's just such a great fight in every respect. That game's cinematic flair is not talked about anywhere near enough. Like the cutscene direction is phenomenal. It was such a restorative project for Samus herself after um, Metroid of the M, which isn't a game that I hate or anything, but it's obviously very divisive. And it feels like, um, you know, Metroid's return to a home console needed to be a big deal. And they portray Samus a lot like Doom Guy, just this walking tank of a person who can just take anything on, deal with it, it's cool. And there's just a, a great feeling of, of weaponizing all that in the final fight and just taking on like what is by far her most formidable foe so far Oof. and just being able to take them on. I love the fight so much. I think I need to play this game. Dude, play it. It's been however many years it's been. <laughs> Three years. <laughs> however many years it's, it's been. It's a while. Number four, Hyperion Returnal. Right. This is non-negotiable. Returnal <laughs> is one of the best games ever made, Scott Elford. They keep telling me it is. I finished Returnal. It wasn't for me, but I love Josh Brown so much that, of course, Hyperion, Returnal, belongs of in the best course. lists. Returnal is an excellent, vibrant, quick, efficient, all the adjectives you want, third-person <laughs> roguelike. And it tops off each of its biomes, of which there are six, with a spectacular boss fight. But it's the fourth boss, Hyperion, that makes it onto this list because we've had difficult bosses so far. We've had dramatically rich bosses so far, but I don't think we've had a boss so far that is fully committed to theatre because <laughs> this boss starts by hearing an organ faintly begin to play the instrumental to the song Don't Fear the Reaper, which is a strange song to hear when you're on an alien landscape, Lovecraftian nightmare realm. But you start hearing it, and as you climb the stairs to fight this boss, it gets louder and louder, and you're wondering at the time, 
Is this part of the soundtrack? Is it part of the world? And when you get to the top, you realize this boss is playing <laughs> this alien organ and he's blasting out this tune, which continues throughout the entire boss fight, which itself is, like I said, like all Returnal boss fights are, mechanically demanding a visual spectacular with particles going off, really readable attacks, I mm. think. You know, you mentioned there in the 2D space where something is just legible. I think what Returnal and the developers generally do really well is giving you a screen full of action with so much stuff popping off, but having it feel readable. You might just be getting through by the skin of your teeth by pure instinct, but it doesn't feel overwhelming in a way that if you're just looking at this footage, you might think it does. I think Returnal is an excellent game and every one of its strengths is summed up in this one sequence alone. Like if you just played this boss fight, you would get what this game is. Oh, yeah. You would understand what it's trying to achieve. And even though there are other satisfying boss fights in the game, this is the absolute peak from a presentational standpoint and probably from a mechanical standpoint as well. If there's one thing that I love about Returnal, and it's a few things, I'll be honest, it is how they took the idea that Nier Automata put forward in 2017. It's not necessarily the only game that did it, but that idea of having um, what would otherwise be 2D projectiles in a 3D space and just showering the whole uh, arena in them and making and just trying to get you to dodge between laser beams and avoid all these different things to get the one hit on the boss. And being in that pocket, like I mentioned the pocket with Metroid, that pocket in a 3D space is altogether more intense anyway. You're watching things coming from behind you to the sides, etc. Returnal plays phenomenally well. Like, I'm getting all back and forward on, oh my god, is it actually phenomenal? Because I thought the difficulty went off the deep end at some point. But it's not to say that those things aren't tweaked. The people who do click with Returnal absolutely love it, for good reason. Like, it is very much a efficient machine when it comes to being a third-person shooter um, hybridized with that almost 2D hard game mentality from the late 80s, early 90s. It is exemplary in that regard and this is one of the best bosses there. Yeah, it's like a bullet hell uh, yeah, yeah, game, yeah. right? And I think this boss fight, and again, all the boss fights in Returnal, feel so high stakes is because they come at the end of a lengthy biome where you're trying to level up as much as you can before you take on that final fight. You want to be at the height of your powers because you know if you get killed by Hyperion, you're back to the start of that biome. You're back to the start of having oh, to God. grind out the weapon levels and your health bar. You just unlocked a memory of the ice. And you kind of forget about that when you just champion it, but that makes it even more difficult and it makes the stakes impossibly high. Number three, Kazuya Mishima, Tekken 8. A lot of people would have assumed that Kazuya is the final boss of Tekken 8. They've been very forward with that in the marketing. However, the fight itself is some Metal Gear Solid 4 business. And what I mean by that is that this channel is something that I haven't seen in a game since the end of MGS4, when you have the fight in Metal Gear between Solid Snake and Revolver Ocelot, where they're channeling the different eras of their fights. Um, and in Metal Gear's case, that means changing the hood. It means giving you different, you know, sound effects. It reminds you of the entire legacy of the franchise to that point. Tekken does the exact same thing. And it's one of the things that I love the most. Not only do they have um, the music changing as you're fighting Kazuya, reminding you of all these different mindsets that Jin has been in over the years, whether he was fighting against Heihachi, discovering himself, fighting Kazuya or whatever. But they also, in a godlike move, give Jin different movesets that connote different eras of his own fighting style. Growing up, learning the Mishima style, moving away from that and learning karate in Tekken 4, being more influenced by Jun, his mum, who is now back in the new game, learning those different styles, putting them all together to give you this ultimate moveset by the end. They also double down on just how awesome the spectacle is by having the fight go on for a ludicrous amount of time. It's like an eight round fight or something. Kazuya just keeps getting back up and keeps getting back up. And at that stage in the fight, this is the very, very end of the game. You've already fought a lot in space anyway. You've already done a lot of ridiculous things, but it's that thing where you've just got a father and son just duking it out and you feel exhausted as a player. There's a bit of backlash, let's say, in the community just saying how long this thing goes on for. I can only say that's the point. Like, I love that they went there. They have the, the cinematic side of it, the gameplay side of it. It's just such a perfect meld of the two. And if you've been a Jin fan slash a Tekken fan for as long as I have, it's one of the coolest things they've ever done. Like, it's just so immaculately handled.
world. And I, I mean, I can't scream about Tekken 8 enough anyway, but oh my God, the end of this game's story was perfect. Games that do that are always incredible. You mentioned Metal Gear Solid 4 there. I always go to the end of Devil May Cry 5 as yeah. well. You have that final showdown and that does something similar where it brings in these older movesets and gets you thinking about previous fights, the history of the characters. What I love about Tekken 8's um, approach to it by the sounds of things is they did this already with Tekken 7, not with the same characters, mm. but they had Heihachi and Kazuya in that game have this epic final battle. And then they pulled it off even better, arguably, in Tekken 8. That series is on such a winning streak. Yep, yep, yep. Number two, the King of Puppets slash Romeo King of Puppets, Lies of P. Now, like many bosses in Lies of P, this is a two-parter. You fight the King of Puppets, which is this hulking industrial monstrosity that can take out pretty much all of your life bar in one swing of its massive fist. But then, in classic From Soft style fashion, of which Lies of P is very much indebted, the boss then sort of gives birth to this second phase, which is a <laughs> Belania style bout with this competitor who is as agile and is as quick and is as devastating as you. So it's essentially pretty much the two extremes of boss fights you can expect from a game like this. You have the big brute and then you have the fast, agile little nipper, for lack of a better term. And Scott, both of these fights could have being an end boss in their own right. Oh they are difficult, they require completely different tactics, completely different movesets, but what's great about them is that it's a proper culmination of the mechanics so far. You need to bring everything you've learned to both sections of this fight if you want to get through it in one piece. You need to understand the mechanics deeply. You need to understand when to parry, when to dodge, when to perform your special moves. And it's a real endurance test. I honestly don't love two-phase fights necessarily. Mm. Sometimes I think they're elongated for the sake of endurance, for the sake of just making something hard that otherwise would be bearable if you had a checkpoint. But this is a two-phase fight that absolutely justifies itself because of the differences in the bosses you're fighting. And again, because it's a visual spectacle as well with the stage transforming around you a little bit. There are more visually spectacular fights in the game, but in terms of pure raw intensity, I don't know if it gets better than this. I want to ask the people, the people listening, do they think that a one-on-one -on -one fight against something that is the same size as you is the best boss fight? Because I wonder, we've had so many of them, and I feel like Souls reignited the fire that was there for, for something like Punch-Out, for example. The camera's over your shoulder, you're fighting another humanoid-style enemy who can keep up with you. Um, obviously, the likes of Zelda have done Dark Link or whatever it is, but in the new age, because technology is so much better, frame rates are better, responsiveness and game engines and everything else is better. Is that just the crystallized form of the boss fight? Do you just need to have this this one-on-one -on -one tussle with something in a 3D space? Like, is that why Elden Ring and the FromSoft stuff is so big? Because people love that feeling. I'm going to throw something out to you now. Do to it. me, I work off the Dragon Ball principle, which is the smaller a villain gets, the tougher they are and more menacing they are. <laughs> like, Frieza. Sorry to go on a tangent. Frieza no, in, in all of his forms never looks as good as his final form before he gets the extra muscles where he's just slender, he's slim, he's channeling all of that power. I would always take someone who looks physically unintimidating but doesn't need to look huge, no. doesn't need to be massive. When I play a From Software game, I always like to see a giant boss fight because I know I can take him down. <laughs> it's when I see the little nipper yeah. when I get very worried. This is also the Simpsons rule of uh, the one dude who's not moving at the center of the gang who has all the cool moves waiting to bust out. Yeah, man, I could only agree. Number one, and the only one that we could agree on, Melania, Elden Ring. Had to be as much as I hate it. It has to be. The boss of bosses. We talked about a few different ones from Elden Ring. We talked about various things from, um, you know, from software overall. And Armored Core only released across 2023 with some awesome bosses as well. But I think you really do have to hand it to Melania. It is the final formula, let's say, of everything that we just talked about. The one-on-one -on -one fight. The fact that you feel outmatched, but you're keeping up. You're trying to live in that pocket of learning the moves, learning the animations. How can I counterattack? Have I, have I built my character? 
character the right way, etc. Melania is just a phenomenal fight, and I think because it has that cinematic edge to it as well, like the way she's introduced, the cutscenes are awesome. I love this Melania fight. I feel like when I think back on the way that I fought Melania, like yes, I summoned one person in, but I remember just tagged it. It was like trying to hang in that space with her for a bit. It was almost like a specific two-on-one cinematic movie style fight where I was going a few rounds with her for a bit. Then I had to tag out and be like, oh my God, give me a minute. Let me go over here for a second. Someone else came in, fought her for a little bit. And I'm always thankful that I got I got the kill. Yeah. Back in the day on 2022, I managed to defeat Elder Ring and I'll never fight her again. <laughs> and I'll do, I'm, I'll just shut the game off. I'm never doing that again. I joke, one of my favorite things about From Software Games is nipping back into putting the summon sign down, dropping back in, helping other people beat Melania, beat the hardcore fights. It's just got to be Melania. She's the best or one of the best fights that From Software's put together. I'm with you, man. I love replaying From Software games and Melania is definitely worthy of this top spot, but I am never fighting her again, <laughs> even though I know more of her moves and how to counter them this time around. There are a few From Software bosses. A lot of them come in the old Hunters DLC for Bloodborne, which I am so pleased I fought, so pleased I beat but I can never return because I've got psychological damage from it. I think Melania is, is such a memorable boss because of that visual nature of her, the differences between round one and round two, where she um, completely transforms into a more magic-based killer. But she has everything that just really grind your gears, right? She's <laughs> got the agility. She's got the ability to get back health. She's got devastating AOE attacks. She has the waterfall dance, which for a, for the longest time was virtually unblockable or unavoidable. It requires you to know everything about the game. But what I love about this boss is just how intimidating it looks at first. But as more people play it, as more time goes on, you realize how much From Software did put in there to counter those seemingly unstoppable attacks at first. And now there are real plans of there are real tactics out there to just neutralize those. Yeah. And I think that's sick to take a boss which honestly feels unfair initially and then make that boss manageable through the community through experimentation that's sick that's what separates her i think from some of the others on this list from software are kings they're pretty good aren't they